All right, hello everyone. My name is Liz. I am the Program and Outreach Specialist here at the Wood County Committee on Aging. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today, sitting across from me is Becky Schooner from Schooner Farms, and she is going to be talking about herbs on the Civil War battlefront. So we are excited to have her here today. Uh, I am going to go ahead and flip this camera around and let Becky take over from here. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm so excited to be here on my little Zoomy, and I am going to be talking about herbs that were used on the Civil War battlefront. But um, those of you who don't know me, my husband and I own Schooner Farms and Inspired by Nature over, um, we're all probably about 10 miles outside of Bowling Green, right on the corner of 6 and 235. We do natural farm management and I am an herbalist, so I convinced my husband to plant over 3,000 lavender plants. And uh, there's nine varieties out there and we do our own distilling, so we have make our own essential oil and we do all sorts of fun, crazy stuff out there, and I, I, I don't work a day in my life anymore because I just do what I love and love what I do. So this is one of those things. So I'm so glad we're here, and we're going to talk about um, herb juice on the Civil War battlefront. And so I kind of got on this topic um, several years ago. I was doing some research, and I stumbled upon the fact that uh, Harriet Tubman, not only was she this phenomenal woman with the Underground Railroad, but she herself was an amazing herbalist. So that was kind of the launch pad to learn a little bit more about herbs used during the Civil War era. So that's what we're going to talk about. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of information out there, and we're just going to dip our toe in. But I'm hoping maybe I'll will inspire you to do a little more research on your own. I know I've got some history buffs out there too. So um, I, uh, one of the things that fascinated me uh, about learning this topic was, it was something I never really thought about. So here we are, you know, 1861 and the Civil War, uh, and a lot of people had moved into towns in the, in the bigger cities, and they weren't as self-sufficient as you would expect. So they had, they had access to markets. They could go to a, a butcher. They could go to a general store and buy their supplies. And people who lived more in the rural areas still were fairly self-sufficient. Um, so once the war hits, you have this, this major disruptive supply. And people, you know, they can't get things that they were normally normally have been able to. Speak up a little bit. Okay. And um, so they would have to wildcraft. And wildcrafting is something that's really kind of fun if you do it now even. Um, you basically you go out and you go in the woods or even in your own backyard and find things that you can eat. Um, so in that time era, in the 1860s, people would, um, you know, particularly ones that lived in town, would go out into the country and they would find rivers or lakes and they would dig up cattails and the tubers of the cattail, they would treat those like potatoes. Uh, they would find mushrooms, berries, nuts, anything like that that they could eat, small game. And they would take it back to their family in the city and, and they would be able to, to eat. Now in the country, um, a lot of people still had gardens and still had cattle and, and livestock that they cared for. And, uh, but they had a problem too, because the quickest way to defeat an enemy is to take out the food source. So, and this would be troops on both sides, not just north or south, it would be both sides would come into an area and, you know, they would come in and if you had a garden, they would take what they wanted and then they'd stomp on everything else. Or if you had items in your pantry, they would take what they wanted and smash the rest. Or if you had livestock, believe it or not, they actually would kill your livestock that they didn't take. So, it was very difficult to eat. Um, for the everyday person, not just the soldiers, because we'll talk about that soon too. But for the everyday person, wild crafting was, was an essential way to find food. Um, and a lot of people didn't know, is, is this mushroom safe? Is this one safe? So there was some experimenting and, and there were some people who died because they ate the wrong thing. Um, but it's interesting when you read diaries uh, in this time era and letters, it's funny how some people, particularly women in the North, would complain, oh, my garden, my beautiful flower garden is now this awful vegetable garden. But someone who had no food, when they saw that vegetable garden, they'd be like, ooh, salivating, you know? So I think it's just a matter of perception. 
But there's one thing, one herb that you find time and time again people people will mention really missing from their diet. And it's not an herb that we think of. Um, we don't really think of this as an herb, but it is, and that's coffee. Um, you'll, you'll read diary entries where, I have no strength, my, my lemon vigor is gone. And it's because they reduce the coffee as a stimulant. And we all know for caffeine, it wakes us up, but it also is a very strong nervine. And it also, the astringent qualities of coffee are good for your liver. And, and other organs, they help to, um, I don't want to say detox, but they help to cleanse it out and keep it, keep it functioning, keep your digestive um, juices flowing. If you think about the common diet during that time period, you have a lot of salted meats, you have you know, older children have a heart attack, um, you know, beans, so very heavy food. So coffee actually was very helpful uh, in for the digestive system. So when you see those complaints, you can kind of understand a little bit better why it wasn't just the, the you know, oh, I'm so weak. It was, you know, like I'm not functioning properly. Because for many people, it was a laxative too. So um, they had to find substitutes to, to, to fill in. And coffee, they could find coffee, but seriously, it was like $20 a pound. And nobody could afford that. Black tea was very hard to find too. So they would have herbal teas like sassafras, uh, dandelion root. But for coffee, when it came to substitutes, um, and this is fun for me, and we all have seen it. When we drive around Northwest Ohio in the summer, on the roads, winding the road, you see this really pretty plant has these little periwinkle blue flowers. Well, that's chicory. And they would take chicory roots and roast them, and then they would mash them in hot water and make coffee. Um, now, it didn't taste like coffee that we're used to, but um, for them, it was it was a, the only available substitute that they had ready access to. And you can actually still find chicory for, for coffee, and some people still drink it as that. So. Um, like Cafe de Monde is, is a chicory coffee, and there's there's several others out there. Sometimes health food stores will have them if you really want to try it. Um, I wouldn't recommend going out to the road and digging up the plants, though, because you know that's not a good idea. Um, but some other weird substitutes, they would take uh, sweet potatoes and make them into slices, dry them and roast them, and then they would since they were dried, when they had some hot water, they pound them in the hot water and make like this um like a mash if you will and strain it off and they would drink that so it was kind of a sweet potato water if you will uh, potato peels like regular old potatoes they peel the potatoes for mash they keep the peels and let them dry and then they when they wanted coffee they would take and they still and this was kind of a uh a delicacy for some people they would take the the potato peels put them in hot water reconstitute them then they mash them up and add butter and uh, milk and sometimes they'd strain it off and drink the liquid or sometimes they'd have it like a soup but they that was a coffee substitute um for teas like i mentioned the dandelion and sassafras there also was uh wild raspberry leaf and that had a lot not only does it taste pretty good but wild raspberry leaf um was also very good for the, the lady parts it helps to tone and strengthen Particularly if you have a lot of cramps, it brings the oxygen to that area, so it helps to um, alleviate that. Uh, they also, babies, um, colics, they would take strawberry leaves and make a very weak tea, and then they'd give that to the babies, and that would help help calm them down, if you will. Or if they had a little fever, strawberry, strawberry um, leaf tea was very good. Um, there's something they call postum that actually we know as post cereal, General Mills, uh, post cereal. There's a lot of ads from that time period. It's kind of funny. They'll have this, this um, big kind of like Santa Claus looking guy. And he's like, don't eat, don't drink that evil coffee. You need post them because it's so much better for you. And all it really was was like that kind of a porridgey oatmeal that um, kind of a gruel really. And they would, they would drink that as a coffee substitute. So not only coffee, but they also didn't have white cane sugar. And they had kind of developed a little bit of a sweet tooth by that point. And the sorghum was a really easy substitute, it's kind of that molasses -y, real earthy um, flavor. They also would use honey, which I know all about that. And um, one thing that they would use that was kind of interesting, and I never tried it, but we, they would take watermelon and pick up the, the inside and boil it down to this really thick syrup. And then they would use that as a sugar substitute. I also do a talk on um, 
uh, a history of cookbooks. And I came across several recipes from this time era that they made a cake using watermelon syrup. And, and I've never tried it, but it sounds kind of interesting, but I don't know if I want to be that patient to wait for my watermelon to boil down to a thick syrup. But I can imagine the taste would have been odd with the, with the watermelon being very concentrated like that. Our diet, our modern diet is more um, salt and, and sugar where before you had people, they really relied on herbs and salt for the flavor for their food. And they've kind of gotten away from that. But back, back in the Civil War era, people were still using herbs to enhance and flavor their food a lot, more so than we do. And that's, there's um, a great, uh, great class I have on culinary herbs that explain why certain herbs go with certain foods. And, and, and this is certainly one of those, those eras where you, when you're looking at recipes, you can see why they use certain things because they had to substitute it for others. So that's kind of fascinating history little tidbit there. Uh, women would make, uh, women that had gardens would make a lot of vinegars. Apple cider vinegar is very simple and easy to make. I've made it myself several times. Um, but what they would do is they would make these vinegars. They take herbs like tarragon, chives, or a combination of herbs, and then they'd soak it in the vinegar, and it, it would be like a digestive, if you will. It helps to stimulate, get your, um, get your enzymes in your mouth as you're chewing to release, and then in your stomach, it helps to release different enzymes because it, um, the way it interacts with your food. So uh, the apple cider vinegar was a very important, um, not only as a digestive, but it also was good because it helps to kill critters. So um, it helps to, uh, help to tone your body, helps to keep your digestive system working well. And a lot of people eat, drink apple cider vinegar now as, um, as an, an aid, if you will. And along with vinegars, you had bitters. Now I'm not talking the kind that you're gonna go put in your mixed drinks like the Eric Doga, but that's kind of what we think of when we think of bitters. But bitters, um, golly, you can make bitters out of walnuts, you can make it out of herbs, you can make it out of all sorts of stuff. And bitters uh, basically would be used as an aperitif because water, as we all know, is very dangerous to drink because it could be full of little critters that could kill you. So a lot of times they would boil their water. That's why they drink a lot of wine and beer because they would kill off the critters. But <clears throat> you would have an, what they would call an aperitif. And that would be like before the meal, you would drink this, this bitter with the vinegar many times or a water or even a, a tea, if you will, to help release the enzymes. And, and as you're eating whatever food you're eating, it helps you digest it. And then they would have aperitif for after dinner as well. So they did have the digestive aids that they were familiar with using or they kind of expanded upon it even more so as a, as a medicinal because it would be much easier as a, a field surgeon to carry around a bottle of a tincture or a digestive than it would be to have a giant giant um, pot over a fire for a tea and then you have a steaming tea you have to try and have a soldier drink for which sometimes would be impossible. So um, tinctures and vinegars were very useful. They, they made a lot of their own and a lot of folk recipes and, and things of that nature. Um, so that was very, very important. Now, in 1863, there was a book released, and it was called, make sure I get this right, Southern Fields and Forests. And that was a huge compendium of plants, and there were, it was a Confederate book. And it was plants of the South. It had a whole section on herbs and how to use them, how to identify them. It also had trees, um, any kind of plant out there that was in the South was in this book. And it, it was instrumental, particularly for the young surgeons to have this book because many of them were less than a year out of school. Some of them had no training. Um, there was only a handful of surgeons in the South, truly. And I can't even imagine what it must have been like for them to just be out of school, be thrust on a battlefield and have hundreds of men with, with horrific injuries. You have no supplies, you have no bandages, you have no no way of knocking them out safely, and you have to try and save these people. Um, so it, it was, uh, this book was really very important, um, and particularly in the South, as I said, because they needed that kind of help because they didn't know about some of these natural remedies. And when you would have troops marching uh, on both sides, north and south, marching around, you would have women and men who would follow. And now 
not only would they maybe help with food or are they nurses, but they also would have some that would be wildcrafters and they would send them out to find different things to be able to bring back so they could feed the soldiers. And this is this is something that's very important, especially when you talk about herbalism. Um, you know, plants are medicine and and food is medicine. And a lot of these soldiers, you know, they're they're marching every day, they're completely dehydrated, they're malnourished because they're eating, you know, tack and, and salty ham. If they had food, they're, you know, maybe they're well packing some things. So they were they were very malnourished. And when they're in a battle, their body was was already in a state of, of disrepair. So to have the strength to be able to heal. That, that was really something. I mean, there's no, you made no mistake, there, there was over 620,000 uh, soldiers that were killed during the Civil War, and mainly that was from disease and, and sickness. It wasn't necessarily being on the battlefield. They, they just did not have the supplies to be able to help take care of them, or the, or the knowledge to help take care of them. I mean, the South didn't have um, Sarah Barton or Garcia Dix, you know, demanding sanitary reform, because imagine, um, on the battlefield, and as I said, they didn't have a lot of supplies. So many times bandages would just be in a pile and they would go rinse them out and dry them and reuse them. Um, you know, and, and Garcia Dix and Sarah Barton were in the north and they're saying, we need clean hospitals, these need to be scrubbed, they need to be sanitary, their sheets need to be washed, we need to change bandages, we have to have air flow in here, we can't have this because and if you see some um, pictures of um, Matthew Brady, uh, particularly the southern southern side, you will see these field hospitals will have herbs hanging down. Those weren't to use for medicinal. That was to keep insects away. And you know, lavender is really good for um, flies, and uh, catnip is great for mosquitoes, believe it or not. And um, on, on these cots where the soldiers were laid, they would take elderly leaves. And, and line the cot and then they would lay the soldier on there because the elderberry helps keep flies away. And that was very important, especially if you had open wounds or anything like that. And like in the bandages, um, you know, the cloth bandages were hard to source, especially clean ones. And um, so they would use leaf, they would take corn husks, they would take um, coffee leaves, they would use mullein leaves, anything that was a big sizable leaf that they could use as a bandage. They would. And many times, uh, particularly with like mullein, um, you have, well, in the country too, you have two really powerhouses in the herbal world because both of them are antiseptic, antibacterial. So to cover a wound, not only does it help provide some coverage, but it also helps to heal because it has some medicinal qualities to it as well. And, you know, making, um, trying to, to source these things, you know, doctors obviously didn't have time. So that's why when I was saying there would be people that would follow, that's what these people would do. They would go and find leaves, they would go and find roots, they would find any kind of um, foods and medicines and, and bring them back to help with that. So, you know, it was um, a lot of things that we don't know. We don't, we don't have that, that reality. So it's interesting that they had to do so many different things just to survive in this. Um, some of the herbs that they did use. Um, snapdragon, the pretty little flowers that we all love in our gardens. Snapdragons are great for um, stomach aches. And it's also good for skin. So if you had a burn, uh, not a real serious burn, but a, I don't want to say maybe like a first degree burn or something, an actual sunburn, um, that would be a nice wash to put and would help the skin and help um, take the pain out. Uh, comfrey is one of my favorite herbs. I have Yarrow, comfrey, and mullein are like my three absolute favorites. But comfrey is uh, it's like peppermint. So if you plant her in your garden, you got to keep an eye on her because otherwise she will walk everywhere and you'll have a comfrey spread. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, oh my God. But if you have apple trees and they're not doing really well, plant some comfrey because comfrey goes deep and it pulls up minerals up out of the earth and it helps to feed that tree, and it, particularly calcium. Um, we'll bring that up, and, and apple trees really do like that. And the thing with um, you know, comfrey is it for the kind of the everyday usage, the term it was called bone knit 
a bone stitch, and that's exactly what it does. It goes in on a cellular level, and it helps to seal and help your bone to re-stitch. It really does do that. Um, so if you have a broken arm or a leg or a sprain or a massive bruise, they would take make a poultice out of the top and they'd, um, mash it up and put it on the, the wound and then cover it. And that actually would, would help to seal the bone. If you had a really bad um, bruising, it helps to, to bring that up and out and help the blood just go back in through the arm so it's not, um, you know, the human helmet heals. Uh, and comfrey is, um, it's not the best tasting herb, so it'd be more for a poultice, a poultice that it'd be used for. Um, but teas for malaria, which is a real big problem, particularly um, in the Virginia area, the South, um, a lot of people have malaria and fever, so they would take um, sea balm, a monarda, if you will, and they would make teas out of that, and that would help with fever. You might recognize sea balm as a tea if you like Earl Grey tea, because bergamot is a kind of monarda, and it gives it that distinct flavor. And so it's a, it's a, it's a not only is it a beautiful herb, butterflies and bees love it, but it's a, it's a nice to use as a tea. And you can go out and pick the flowers and leaves out and make teas now, so like as long as you don't spray your yard. And it has a really nice, um, delicate floral flavor, but it is good for, for fever. Slippery elm was really good for whooping cough. Uh, that was a, a pretty major malady. A lot of, I see a lot of soldiers had um, coughing or colds or really phlegmy kind of situations. Uh, you see a lot of that. Uh, they would use mullein. Mullein is a biennial herb, and it, this is a mullein here, and you'll see it out in the ditch banks. It's that really tall spiky with the yellow flowers on it. That's mullein. And mullein has lots of uses. And the Romans used to take it and they would cut it off and they dip the tip in oil and then they would use them as a torch. Uh, but mullein, you can use the root, you can use the leaves, and you can use the flowers. And you can make teas. And um, it helps with um, pulling, pulling congestion up and helping make an effect so it helps you get rid of it. Um, people who had asthma, they would give them mullein tea and that would help quell their symptoms a little bit. Uh, but the neat thing about mullein, um, I think is fascinating, is that uh, the leaf on the, the crown, way at the bottom, so a real tall spiky plant, way at the bottom you have a, a crown of the leaf. And the leaves are, are soft like velvet and they're, they're fleshy. So what they would do, you know, they're marching all the time constantly and they'd wear the bottom of the shoes out. So they would take mullein and put it inside their shoe and use it for a cushion. Now, not only was it a good cushion, but if we go back to the diet of these soldiers, many of these guys had gout and they were in so much pain because they're marching all the time. And mullein actually is great for gout because it helps pull that lactic acid out from the foot. Because as you're stomping on it constantly, you're releasing obviously the, the fluids that are you're soaking up through your feet, mm -hmm. and that would help with that. And so it actually was a, a very relieving kind of an herb. Um, and they also would use um, lamb's ear they'd put in their shoes. Same kind of thing, that spongy, real soft. And they'd also use like a toilet paper because it was spongy and soft. They had their own charm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then we've got yarrow, which is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite herbs. And this year I actually we distilled some. And so I have a yarrow hydrosol, it's good for skin issues. And it's good for um, burns and bruises and minor cuts. But yarrow, as the plant, the the flowers, if you dry them, and the leaves, and you dry them, and then you pulverize them into a powder. And actually, Roman, they, this, for as long as we know, this is even in the Greek, when the Greeks were at their height, they would use yarrow, which is Aquila from Achilles. They would use Aquila or yarrow and they'd have it in a pouch. And what would happen is if you had a large cut when you'd be at a battle or you're cut by a sword, they would take yarrow and they pour it in the wound and then it would stop the bleeding immediately. So not only would it stop the bleeding, but it's also antibacterial, antifungal, antibiotic. So it would keep that wound clean until you were able to, to deal with it. Um, now, if you are out in the garden today and you hurt yourself and you don't have dried yarrow at, at your ready, you can go and take the leaf 
take out and muddle it really hard in your hand so you start to start to release the, the juices and the compounds and put it in a cut and it will help stop the bleeding. Uh, if you're in the kitchen and you cut yourself with a knife and um, you know you, you've got to get help but you don't you know you don't want to bleed all the way all over your car. And I know you're going to look at me and go, gosh, you're going to zoom me and go, this is crazy. Um, but go into your spice cabinet and grab cayenne pepper. It won't hurt. It won't be hot. I promise you. Pour that on the cut, literally, and it will stop the bleeding immediately. And again, it's antibacterial, antifungal, antibiotic. So it's going to keep that wound clean until you get to the hospital. My husband is, has had lots of cayenne dumped on him through his life, <laughs> and he has survived. And usually, if he's had to have a stitch or something, like, why is there cayenne? Why? What's this orange stuff? Cayenne pepper. <laughs> but it really does work. So if that happens, try it and say, hey, Becky, thanks a lot. Um, and it also would make um, salves and ointments and liniments and <clears throat> concrete, plantain, if it's out in your yard. I know you have it and you probably spray it because you think I hate this stuff, but plantain is an amazing herb. The leaves are great. If you're ever stung by a bee and you don't spray your yard, take a few plantain leaves, chew them up, and put them on that thing and it will pull that poison right out. Um, we've had to do that lots of times at the farm with the volunteers and, and, and help because there's obviously bees everywhere. Um, but it does really work. And um, chickweed is something that you can not only eat because it has a lot of vitamin C and also potassium, but it was good um, along with um, um, jewelweed to make a, a cream that you could, um, <clears throat> sorry, or a um, salve that you could put on if you had poison ivy. And a lot of times in, in the wild, when you go out to find jewelweed, it'll be growing near poison ivy. It's kind of funny how nature gives you the cure and the disease all in one spot there. Uh, hops, and not just for beer. Um, for the longest time, and I, I go off tangent every once in a while, sorry, but I, uh, I've always wanted a hop tunnel. And so out at the farm, we have one now, and it's between the two ponds, and we plant hops in there. And it's been a heat two or three different varieties. And I wanted to just like rip Van Winkle tunnel. So when you went in there, you're like, oh, I'm so sleepy. And I really thought this was better this. And what they would do is they would take hops and make a really strong kind of a tea, if you will. And they would have soldiers drink it because it was a sedative. So it was able to help, help them calm down and settle them. Um, and it, a lot of people, like that's one of the things about beer, like hoppy beers. Some people are like, oh, I don't like hoppy beers. Well, that hoppy taste, that, that's, that's um, part of helping you sleep. And when we harvested hops this year, I had a handful of them I put on Stringer's desk and I went and did whatever. And I came back a few hours later and said, oh, I'm like this. And I said, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just so sleepy. I don't know why. I'm like, oh, it's like, hot. I said, okay, you I took them away. <laughs> but, um, I don't have children. Um, but sage. Sage is another one of those herbs that most people just think of, oh, Thanksgiving, stuffing. Yeah, absolutely. But sage is not only a really tasty herb, but it, it has a lot of medicinal properties. It's really good. If we have anybody in my house has a cold, they come home with a cold or a cough or a stuffy nose, it's sage tea for you. Because sage will do that. They will help draw that up. And even Indian nose it helps draw that up and gets it out of you, and you will feel a lot faster. And it's not the best tasting, you can add a little honey to it, but basil is very good for that too. If you have fresh basil, it's good for colds and coughs. Um, then you have elderberry leaves, and there's elderberry syrup that you can make, it has a lot, it's good for your immune system. But elderberry leaves, as I was saying, they, they put them on in the pots, so that way they keep the flies away. Um, and we were talking about nutrition deficiency. So if you had soldiers that you know are already weakened state, you might, if you were near a, a lake or a river that had a lot of cattails, it has a lot of vitamin C and potassium. And one of the problems they found a lot, I've read a lot about when it talks about herbs in, in the Civil War, is scurvy and dysentery were just rampant. And of course, they didn't have vitamin, you know, enough vitamin C, enough nutrition in the diet, so it was a real malady. So they would go out and um, harvest wild onions. Uh, was really good for that. Uh, garlic was really good for that as well. But there were things they could do to help offset some of those things. And 
then you think about people at home. And as we first were talking, um, you know, their gardens are trampled, they, they're out wild crafting, they have a family to raise. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these, really mainly women and older, older men um, and kids, would go out and they barter with their community. And that's how communities would survive because someone might make soap, another person might have um, a dairy cow, one person might have chickens, they have eggs. So they were constantly bartering with each other to be able to survive. And there's a great, um, <clears throat> I found a really neat diary entry from a mother who had, I believe it was like four kids. <clears throat> and her one son, she thought he was the most brilliant kid in the world because they were peanut farmers at the store. And they went and um, they kept them. And they, they would eat them while well, brilliant because the fat and the peanuts would help make you feel full and then the fat is, is good for you. So her son, they would have all these soldiers going through their town <clears throat> and they would sell dried um, sassafras root, sassafras roots or um, dandelion roots or chicory roots and, and they have them ready in their cell. But her son came up with this idea. You know how we all like hot cocoa when it gets cold? Well, he had a brilliant idea. He took these peanuts and he mashed the bejesus out of them. And then he would add, if they had milk available, he'd add milk or he'd add water and made like a really thick, soupy peanut butter. And that was like their substitute for a hot cocoa. And they would sell that to people. And they actually, that's how they survived the war was, was this uh, peanut butter cocoa they made. And if you think about it, you know, those fats were really, really good for them. So, um, and they brought in money so they could barter for other things too. So, it, you know, it's just really interesting. Kind of like now, we were just talking, mm -hmm. you have to think outside the box to be able to, to navigate this new dynamic that we're all in. Um, but, you know, you would have uh, nurses that would come and go, you would have doctors that would come and go. It, it, it was just, it was, I can't even imagine what it had to be like on the battlefield. But I, I read a diary of one uh, surgeon. He was kind of just at his wit's end and they were at a battle and he was just, you know, how how and what am I gonna do? And I had nothing, I had no supplies. And he was from the north. And um, he saw Harriet Tubman walking across the field with her giant satchel. And he I get I get misty when I think about this. He was so overjoyed that she was there because she was a powerhouse of herbal knowledge. That she had learned growing up on the plantation from her ancestors. And then when you think about it, when slaves were brought here, they were used to plants in Africa. They weren't used to plants here. So they had to relearn plant medicine. And she really benefited from that knowledge. And she saved hundreds of soldiers on the north, um, black and white folk. So, I mean, she is an amazing woman. And, and I really highly encourage you, if you're interested in that, to check out the, the aspect of her herbalism because she. She just, it was amazing. It really was. And um, that could be a whole talk on its own. And um, I uh, <clears throat> I really, I really am very pleased that I was able to, to discover that. Because that's, that's, I think, is really kind of cool. I love to learn about those little nitty gritty history facts of how, how the mother with four kids survived or, you know, um, you know how communities survived. Because that, battles in general are great in its own right, but it's interesting, the human experience, how people navigated that. And some other um, interesting little tidbits, I, uh, as I was mentioning, I do a, a talk on cookbook history and some recipes of that era, and I came across one that just fascinates me because it has acorns in it. And I was old, I was always under the impression that acorns, you shouldn't, they could be poisonous. But I didn't, she doesn't say what kind of tree the acorn comes from, but this is a an excerpt from Patricia Mitchell's book, Civil War Plants and Herbs. And this was a substitute for coffee. And she writes, take some ripe acorns, wash them well in the shell, dry them, parch until open. Take the shell off, roast with a little baking fat, and you will have a splendid cup of coffee. I don't know. I, but and again, she doesn't say what kind of acorns, so don't go out and do that. <laughs> but um, you know, it's funny when you look at old recipes, the word recipe comes from uh, the Latin for, for to deceive. 
And it used to be in the medieval, medieval era when you go to an apothecary and maybe you're going for a medicinal or maybe you're going for a, a spice mix of brine turkeys or, or what have you. You would go in and the, the apothecary would write you a list. Well, it would just be the list of ingredients it, and it was called a receipt. So up until about the 1940s, you would hear the word receipt used a lot by German and a lot of German and Swiss because they, they use that word receipt for recipe. So that's where the word recipe comes from, is from receipt. And it was, when you look at old cookbooks, um, really old cookbook, it's just a list. There's one I came across that was written in uh, 15 something, and it was 12 pigeons, uh, a cake of, of uh, lard, a bucket of flour, and four young piglets. And that's, that's all it tells you. And so you're like, what is this? And that's what they were. It would just be a list. There would be no instructions or anything like that. Instructions weren't included until a lot later. And during the colonial era, you had what they called homekeeping books. And even into the Civil War era, um, homekeeping books were an invaluable resource for the housewives because not only would it give you recipes on how to cook things, but it would tell you how to, how to butcher a cow, how to make soap, how to make lye. So it, it was a wonderful, almost like an encyclopedia, if you will. And it'll give you herbs and what kind of herbs you look at and everything. And then after the Civil War, you know, there was a great book that was written by um, a woman and her three sons, and I can't think of the name of her, her name, but they wrote this like 23 volume set of housekeeping. And this is where instructions were first put in, really instructions and a listing. The listing was listed first and then they had what to do with it after. But there's something interesting in the 1850s that we see a shift when it comes to these housekeeping books. And that is they have morning chapters. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, morning. Because you did, death was, was everywhere. And after the Civil War, of course, it was really everywhere. So there would be complete chapters dedicated to how do you mourn? What do you do? What, you know, how long do you wear this? You know, and it was just crazy, some of the, some of the really strict rituals they had, but um, that was something that women had access to. And they were expensive because, you know, books, books were expensive and a lot of people couldn't read. So they would have to rely on neighbors or, or someone to help them navigate through those books. Uh, I mentioned apple cider vinegar, super simple to make. Uh, so a lot of people did make that's one of the reasons, you know, Johnny Appleseed was so prolific when he came around here. Um, you know, the, the agreement was with the government, you had to plant so many apple and pear trees. And so Johnny Appleseed would, you know, ride the rivers and bring, bring um, apple starts to a lot of people. And, and um, there's some great books that talk about when he was in Perrysburg and Defiance and Napoleon. Um, so those are kind of fun things too. But um, apple cider vinegar was, was used a lot, and it, was, and it really is a, a medicinal. Like it definitely is a medicinal because the astringent qualities help. And again, I don't want to say detoxify, but they help your liver purge gunk out. So very important, especially with the kind of diets people were eating at this time period. Um, apple cider vinegar, apple cider was really um, a godsend when it came to having something ready and available. And then, that kids would drink too. So you could heat it up or add it to um, stews or what have you and kind of or salad dressings and things like that um, in the do. Now, there's one herb that really took a brutal hit during the Civil War and that's golden seal. And golden seal uh, is still um, a, a protected herb. And it's kind of, uh, it's really kind of magic if you want to, I'm, I'm going to say it, it's magic because it is a cure-all, what they call a cure-all herb. And golden seal, not only is it, well, I'm sorry, I threw it on fungal, it, it's great for your immune system. Um, it has a lot of anti-inflammatory properties. It's very good if you're a diabetic and your insulin is out of control. Golden seal can help you maintain the level. Um, it's great for, for cleansing your vital organs. It's really good for the liver. It's good for the lymph system. It helps you, it helps it uh, purge and drain. Because a lot of times, because we sit a lot, especially now, we sit a lot and your lymph system is not as active as what it should be. So, Golden Seal actually helps get that revved up, helps you pull those things from your body. Um, and it's really good for your respiratory system, too. So, again, like I say, a cure all. And it's good for a colonic as well. Um, it was, 
is harvested to the point of almost extinction. Thankfully, there are people who are able to save some. And, and as I said, you can still get it now. It's still protected, but um, there's a few places you can get it and, and try and grow it on your own. Um, goldenrod, which is prolific, and everyone thinks that they're sneezing and everything. It's probably not true. Um, but goldenrod is the, the weed you see, like the late summer, it's that flower with all little yellow flowers on it. That's goldenrod. And one thing I did when I was running herbs, and there's so many of them, and they do so many things, it's like, ooh, how do I remember all this? One of the things I found, and this is not 100% every time, but herbs that have yellow flowers tend to, and not always, but tend to be good for the urinary system and also the eyes. So that was easy for me to kind of remember what their use was. And I mean, you gotta double check, but that was kind of a, a good one. The goldenrod um, has a very traditional herb and it was used a lot for kidney stones. So if you had kidney stones, you would drink copious amounts of uh, tea that would have goldenrod in it and it would help, help dissolve them and help get them out of your system. Um, really good for um, just overall kidney support, if you will. The Native Americans would chew on the flowers if they had a toothache. Um, also, it was good for sore throats. They would they would make really thick um, teas with it and add a lot of um, honey and goldenrod to it, and it would and it would help with the sore throat. So again, a lot of different uses. Um, garlic was, you know, one of the one herb that we all use. We all kind of well, not everybody, but most of us like, and we all use in cooking. Kind of a very a very easy herb to use. Um, but garlic is great for the cardiovascular system. It's really good um, with parasites, with worms, um, coughing. If you have um, a cold, one thing I do at this time of year, I will go out and, and harvest fresh garlic out of the garden. So and this is about the time you're in your planet. So we'll have fresh garlic like in September. And I let it cure and then I'll go out and I'll take a, a mason jar, like a quart jar, and I'll fill about halfway with cloves, just the cloves. And then I'll take honey and, and cover all of the garlic cloves so I got about that much over the top, an inch, but you want to leave plenty of head space. So what you do is you put that in your jar and take a bowl, put it in the bowl, just set it in the bowl, and then just gently put the lid on it and, and leave it on the counter overnight. And what happens is the garlic and the honey kind of do this dance and, and, it, and it makes the honey a little more watery and releases some of the compounds of the garlic. So the next day you go and just finger tighten, don't like just, just finger tight, keep it in the bowl and put it in the fridge and it will last for a year. And what I use that for is anytime I feel like I've got the crud coming on, I got a cough, a tickle in my throat, I go and I take one of those garlic cloves and pop it. And yes, it puts hair on your chest. <laughs> and um, but it kill, it will help kill all that crud that's in your throat. And you know, if I think, oh boy, I don't know if I can eat all these, then I'll use them like in marinades or, or things like that as well. But it, it's kind of a dual purpose. You can do the same thing with lemons and honey. Um, it's good medicinal and it, it has a really nice um, honey flavor, um, lemon honey flavor when you do that. And the garlic is nice like on pork or chicken, you can put it as a, a glaze and things like that, or save it and use it for salad dressing or that kind of thing. Or like you say, just pop those garlic cloves and you're feeling the urge and it will help. Uh, mint, <clears throat> there's so many kinds of mint. There's you know apple mint, there's, there's uh, you know, chocolate mint, there's strawberry mint, there's this mint, that mint, everybody's mint. And mint is an herb that is like coffee. If you're not careful, it's everywhere. So many times when you plant it in a container, maybe you sink a, a container in the ground and plant your mint if you don't want it to go all over to walk everywhere. But mint um, is a cooling herb. And make no mistake, when you when you see, and this is I think one of the magic things about herbs, because you have cultures that are in um, the tropic zone. A lot of those cultures have mint, cilantro, cooling herbs are very predominant in their cooking because it helps cool the body. And when you're eating, when you have real spicy food, it helps to quell that, that heat. So peppermint is great for when you're nauseous. It's really good for that. It's also great for um, headache concentration. Um, I, I carry a, a little uh, nasal stick, like if I'm feeling kind of sleepy, I'll, I'll take 
take a little um, sniff and it helps kind of revive you. But one thing that's really nice for um, peppermint and when you have a headache, if you have peppermint essential oil, or even if you're in the garden and you have peppermint, just take it and muddle it. But if you take uh, peppermint essential oil, and always want to use a carrier oil, so whether it's sea almond or you know, olive oil or coconut or whatever kind of oil you have, just take just a few drops of the carrier oil, put that in the palm of your hand, and you drop it through a peppermint essential oil. Mix it together and then take that and put it on the back of your neck, right on your antipodal lobe. And what that does is it opens up the, the blood vessels and helps bring more oxygen to your head, so which will help with a headache. Um, and that's what they, they would use it that way as well. Then you can do the same thing if you muddle it and you get those compounds to release in the plant and just put it right on there. I'll just take like a bandana and just tie it on there if I'm working out and I'm hot and it's in the summer. And that will actually help cool you down. So it helps to, help to bring that cool, refreshingness to, to your brain and bring more oxygen flow. So that's really a super easy way. And that was, um, peppermint was cultivated um, even before the Civil War. There's a lot of farms that grew peppermint. There's farms today that have just miles and miles of peppermint. And when you think of um, toothpaste, that's where the, the mint, the mentha, that's where that comes from. It's from, from plants. That's where that comes from. And you would find there used to be a um, sage farm here in Bowling Green, down south of town, um, kind of across from where Polly is. And there used to be a field there. And there, there was a sage farm. So there used to be a um, uh, herb tonnage house up in Toledo, and they would take the, the herbs up there, and that's how they got around. Um, another little, it's really sweet little herb is calendula, and they use that a lot, and even today it's used a lot for those. Um, calendula is that real pretty kind of orangey yellow flower. Um, <clears throat> it's great for moisturizers or lotions. It's did a lot in baby products, but it's very gentle and very good for the skin, like for ferns or cuts or scrapes, it's really good for that helps to bring healing and it's very soothing. So it um, helps with the pain receptors on there to kind of uh, kind of quiet them down a little bit and it helps with that. Um, I like to take calendula, dry it and um, just put it in a big mason jar, like half, half that much calendula leaf or blossoms and then fill it with an oil and um, then I'll, what I'll do is I'll let that sit for about six weeks and then I strain the oil off and I use that oil when I make soap or if I'm making lotions or anything like that, that's it all. I'll use that for because it has that nice quality. Um, during the Civil War, they would use calendula very much the same way. They used it a lot in washers for the eyes. It's very, very good for helping to, because um, again, it's, most herbs are antibacterial, antifungal, and all that big jazz. It would help to clean out the eyes. Like if you were on the battlefield and there was a lot of cannon fodder and there's a lot of fire and, and smoke, you know, your eyes just get really, really, um, just take a beating from all that grit and stuff in the air. And they would use Honda as a wash for that. So um, still used today. You might find it um, in the health food stores. They've got calendula lotions and things like that. That's, that's one of the reasons why. And again, um, comfrey is um, a really amazing herb. It really is. And it was used a lot for broken bones, sprains, especially if they had to amputate, they would take that and, and make poultice over the amputation. And that, granted the bone was gone, but it would help to bring healing to that much quicker. Um, and many times they would have to cauterize that to, to stop the bleeding and all that. Um, but they would use a lot of poultices. And uh, like I said, the leaf, um, of many plants, actually not only was it a bandage, but it also had medicinal properties too. So I hope I've encouraged you to learn a little bit more about herbs, and um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll open it up to questions if there are any, or maybe I bored you to that. <laughs> all right, I'm going to ask all of you to unmute so you might see a message on your screen uh, that you can select in case you have any questions to ask Becky. I do, I just have to find them. <laughs> the ones you said the leaves you said you used for bandages it, did you say mullen was one m-u-l-l-e-n is that right m-u-l-l-i-e-n i-e-n okay With, and what were some of the other leaves you used for bandages Comfrey, uh, 
I also would use uh, corn, corn stalks because they're nice and long. You may be able to wrap them around the wound. Any kind of leaf that you could find that has the painful size, many times could be used as a bandage. When you talked about watermelon syrup, were you boiling down the rind or the contents of the melon? The, the fruit, the, the pink part. Okay. We boil it down so you get a really thick syrup. And like I said, I, I've seen these recipes, but I haven't tried one yet, so I don't know. <laughs> but it's the pink part. Mm -hmm. Or my glasses, so I'm missing. <laughs> oh, review what you did with the garlic because sometimes the the sound would go in and out, and I didn't catch everything. You put the garlic uh, cloves, and then you cover them in honey, and then what? Well, you you just cover it all the way with honey. Make sure you have it in a bowl because if you don't, you'll learn you'll learn like I did that it, it ferments as it sits in the fridge. And it will bubble up, and then one day you'll open the fridge, and you'll have this lovely uh, garlic glaze every, everywhere. <laughs> and that's why you want to keep it in a bowl. But um, one day, <clears throat> take the garlic, put it in a jar, fill it with honey, just set the lid on top. Oh. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the next day, you take you just finger tighten the jar. Keep it in the bowl, and then put it in the fridge. And it will stay in there. It will stay good for a year easily. There are lots of scratching. <laughs> um, and Carlton and Janice asked, can you recommend any related books? Oh, golly. Um, <laughs> boy, I did this, I put this together a month ago. Um, um, not, there's not any one that's like sticking out for me. I read a lot of um, herbal folklore books. Um, right now I'm doing a lot in the, the Middle Evil era. And, um, I'm sorry, I don't, I can't give you a, a definite. There is one though. Let me see, I did mention the one. Um, that's by Patricia, Patricia, Patricia Mitchell. And she wrote Civil War Plants and Herbs. And she, she does have some different um, herbal information in there for the Civil War. That's about the only one off the top of my head. Um, I put this together about five years ago, so I apologize. I don't have a good uh, source on that. Really? Any other questions from anyone? Would that book be hard to find? It might be. It might be. Um, Google it and see if you can find it anywhere. You know, it's amazing. All the stuff you find on the internet anymore, it just blows my mind. Um, you, know, you find a lot of extracts and um, things like that. And many times when I'm doing my research, that's kind of where I'll start and then try and disseminate and, and then go from there. But there's a lot of information out there about, about um, this particular topic about herbs in the Civil War. I was surprised, actually. I'm always concerned because they always say you can't believe everything on the internet. And I guess the way to do that, just if you see it and the same thing 20 times, you know, it must be well, true. <laughs> I have to vet it out, you know, I'll, if, it, if I think it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, but I'll vet it out if there's, you know, some little niblet of information that might interest me. And I'll take that and I'll research it out to make sure that it's, it's good. But if I'll read it and I'm like, mm, then I just kind of glean over it. Because you're right, there's lots of stuff out there that isn't any good. But there's lots of stuff that is good. So mm -hmm. it's unfortunate we have to wade through it all, mm -hmm. but we do. And how, where would you buy that herb you were saying was like the uh, best one of all or something? Oh, a cure all? Uh, Golden Field? Yeah. Oh. There's actually, uh, I think it's here in Ohio, um, if you type in Golden Seal Plant, it will come up with the Golden Seal Conservancy, and you can buy <clears throat> Golden Seal directly from them. And where are they located in Ohio? You're not going to find it anywhere else other than there. Yeah, and you said that's in Ohio? I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure they're in Ohio, Southern Ohio area. They're like ginseng. You know, ginseng is... is um, Highly, highly 
stolen from from people all over the south and so they're very protective of it and, and, and rightfully so because it is a book there. so same thing with golden seal it's one of those that people will steal if they find so there's just a few outlets where you can actually resource the plant and i'm pretty sure they're in ohio or they were at least a couple, couple years ago Do we have any other questions? Are you a member of any of the societies that are around? Oh gosh, I used to be. Um, I'm so I'm part of the uh, American Herbal Guild, and uh, there's some different things. But you know, honestly, I, I just I don't have time for all that stuff anymore. So I I don't, which is kind of a shame. But I, I I really do like their resources, and I'm friends with a lot of people. But I just don't have time to. Be in a lot of groups and these days. Yeah, I just wondered if you had one to recommend. Locally, are you here in Bowling Green or Perrysburg? Perrysburg? But well, I'll go anywhere. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a there. Well, there's the Toledo Botanical Gardens. There's an herb group that meets there, and I've I've spoken there many many times. Um, and they are really nice resource. They do a lot. They do a lot of outreach, so if you're interested in learning things, not just, oh, this is a mint plant, but you really want to learn, that's a good group. Um, and if you just go through the Toledo Botanical Gardens, you can find it. Um, one I belong to that I, I enjoy um, is uh, the Gathering Basket Herb Society, and they are in uh, out of Finley. And it's a great group because they... Uh, they do all sorts of um, field trips. They'll go to different farms to learn about different different herbs and, and how to grow them. And they'll they'll go to plant sales and they have a plant sale. And they do a lot of, of um, education. I've spoken there a lot on herbs and um, fermenting and all sorts of stuff. So that's a really good group um, that I belong to that I know does stuff. But you know, check out the um, Toledo Botanical Garden. I bet there's some other stuff up in Perrysburg too. I mean, I'm sure because everybody likes herbs. Check five seven seven. Vicki Gallagher might have a good idea of some groups up there. Okay. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thanks everybody for for uh, zooming with me today. <laughs> And thank you, Becky, for being here. We really appreciate it. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop this video here.